Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon or evening, wherever you are in the world. I'd like to welcome you to another Artex Academy webinar. We are working today with Dr. Trevor DeVries from the University of Guelph, and he'll be talking to us today about optimizing the eating behavior of dairy cows. So a few housekeeping things before we get started. Throughout the presentation, you can ask any questions you like through the question and answer section of the webinar, or you can do it through the chat. We are really excited to have you with us. Thank you very much. And the floor is yours, Trevor. Great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, you can hear me and see me well? Yes, we can. Great. Well, thank you for the invite to be here. It's a uh, pleasure to, to be here today and to um, be able to share this webinar with you here uh, on the topic of optimizing eating behavior of dairy cows. And what I'd like to do is walk you through uh, largely a lot of the research that uh, we've been doing in this area over the last number of years, uh, starting off thinking about or getting you to think a little bit about why eating behavior is important uh, in, in dairy cows, and then what are some practical things that we can think about from primarily from a management and housing standpoint that's going to allow uh, dairy cows to optimize their eating behavior with yeah the end goal of, of optimizing health and production and efficiency in, in our cows that we manage. And I guess the, the, the big point I want to make uh, starting off is the fact that it's not only important what we feed to dairy cows, and obviously we, we have years of knowledge of, of nutrition and, and uh, feeds and, and, and good nutritional uh, programming for dairy cows. And, and that's a, obviously a key component in terms of getting the nutrients into cows that they need to optimize production. But at the same time, we need to realize that it's also how they consume their feed and, and the behavior around that's, that's gonna really dictate what those cows actually do in response to those diets that we put in front of them. And, and so that's what I kind of want to walk through here uh, today in, in this webinar to start off with is, is the idea of, of the importance of that eating behavior from optimizing that uh, diet that we put in front of those cows. And so the first question that I want to consider and get us to think about is why do we care? And the probably the easiest and most simple answer is the fact that changes in feed consumption in dairy cows must be mediated through changes in their feeding behavior. And when we think about dairy cows, uh, we're looking at a animal that we're keeping obviously to produce milk. The production of that milk is gonna be limited by the amount of nutrients that animal consumes. And so for the most part, the amount of milk or the total milk production is gonna be related to how much feed that cow consumes. And if we want that cow to produce more milk, which is obviously an attractive goal, we want that cow to consume more feed. And to get that cow to consume more feed, we need that cow then to change some aspect of her eating behavior because that eating behavior is really what dictates how much feed she consumes. And a good way of looking at it is to look at the schematic, which I put on the screen here, which suggests that really the intake of the cow, so the dry matter intake of the cow is really a function of all these different aspects of her eating behavior. In fact, uh, it's actually a mathematical uh, function of those things. So the amount she consumes, her dry matter intake in kilos per day or pounds to day, per day, whatever way we look at it, is going to be a function of how many meals she has per day and the size of those meals. So the size times the frequency equals the total she consumes. Same thing goes with the time course of eating. So the amount of time she spends eating at the bunk per day multiplied by the rate at which the cow consumes her feed equals her total consumption level. And so if we want cows to eat more feed, we need her to change some aspect or aspects of her eating behavior. Having more meals, larger meals, eating longer, eating faster, or some combination of those things. Now the question is, well, what is most important or, 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 or is it all a combination of all those factors together in terms of trying to stimulate intake in dairy cows? And we've tried to look at that from a, a study standpoint. And uh, we published a paper a few years ago where we actually uh, 
took data from a whole bunch of studies we had collected previous to that, put it together and tried to model mathematically what factors, behavioral factors particularly, were most associated with the overall intake level of those cows. And what we observed was that the two primary variables, eating behavior variables associated with intake were the amount of time, so feeding time and meal frequency of the cow. So how much time she was spending at the bunk per day, as well as how many times she went to the bunk and had a, had a, had a individual or unique meal. And while those were the two primary, those other behaviors like the rate at which she consumes her feed, the size of those meals were also positively correlated, but did not explain as much variation. And so while, again, those are important aspects, when we're thinking about total production and, 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 and total intake, sorry, we need to be really thinking about what are the factors, say, potentially limiting how much time she spends or what are the things that are stimulating her to go to the feed bunk as often throughout the day to maximize, say, her meal frequency. And, and just as an example, this is just pulling out the data in the graph here where you see that, again, lots of variation here in terms of intake as well as uh, individual feeding time. And each of these data points represents individual cows, all uh, consuming different amounts, spending different amounts of the, uh, time at the feed bunk. But if you look at our highest intake cows, which would also be our highest producing cows, they're spending at least four or five, even more hours per day at the feed bunk. And so anything that's potentially restricting that or limiting their ability to get to the feed bunk is going to potentially have a negative impact on those cows in terms of optimizing their intake and, and their resulting production. And so from a management standpoint, a housing standpoint, we need to think about, okay, what are the things that are stimulating time at the bunk or, or, or maybe the other way looking at it, or are there bottlenecks? Are there things that may be limiting those cows from getting to the bunk and spending as much time there that they need to? In addition to the time course of eating, uh, in terms of the effect that it has on intake, we also need to think about the effect that it has on rumen function and health. And we know that the rate of consumption, the size of meals cows have, all those kind of things are gonna have a direct impact on how quickly, say, nutrients get into the rumen of the cow. And we know that can be problematic. If cows eat too fast, if they have too big of meals too quickly, that slug feeding type kind of eating response that we often observe that has a negative impact on the rumen environment. Acid production increases too quickly, absorption rates can't keep up, we end up with large in, within day depressions in pH, also known as, or can be described as say subclinical ruminal acidosis. And that then has a trickle down effect in terms of fiber digestion, risk of milk fat depression and related type things. And so we see then a link, a direct link between how the cows eat and the actual kind of functional uh, attributes of the rumen and some of the uh, resultant production responses that we see associated with that. And just an example of that is, is an association between meal frequency and, and milk fat percentage in cows. And this is some data pulled from a study where we see a positive association there, whereby those cows with more meals per day have greater milk fat content. And that's because those cows that are having more meals per day are having a more steady intake of nutrients into the rumen, experiencing less kind of within day depressions in rumen pH, which is gonna translate into lesser risk of things like uh, milk fat depression associated with say uh, low rumen pH and, and problems with biohydrogenation and, and related pathways, which uh, can happen. So important from that perspective to keep that eating behavior as steady as possible and consistent as possible. In addition to productive outcomes like milk fat, we also know that just overall efficiency can be affected there as well. And this is some data that comes actually out of Israel where they are looking at cows and classifying cows based on efficiency and, and a lot of interest in the industry in terms of uh, creating or identifying more efficient animals. And uh, they identify cows as being either low, medium or high efficiency. And what they observed interestingly was that those cows that were the most efficient, the high efficient, as seen in the black line here, uh, the solid black line on the graph in front of you, those cows had a different eating pattern than those cows that were less efficient. In fact, those cows consumed smaller meals throughout the day, uh, particularly at kind of the peak eating periods of the day, and they consumed their feed slower. And so things I described before, which were probably beneficial also from an intake and 
and room and health standpoint are also promoting better efficiency in terms of likely related to the fact that that type of eating pattern is going to be more conducive to better fiber digestibility in those cows, which we know is probably one of the most limiting factors from an overall digestion efficiency standpoint. And so if we can get cows to eat in this so-called better manner, we can also create more efficient cows uh, at the end of the day as well. The other aspect of eating behavior that's very important is what the cow actually does with the feed from a, um, a, a total consumption or, or actual consumption standpoint. And one of the things that we spend a lot of time looking is at not only the time course of consumption, but what the cow actually does with that feed in the bunk. And this is an example of that where you see this cow sorting this TMR. And we often provide a TMR, a total mixed ration to cows in, in the dairy industry with the idea of promoting this homogenous mixture that the cow is going to eat in, in the balance that we put in front of her. But the problem is, from an eating behavior standpoint, cows don't like to do that. They like to sort their diet and they like to eat certain components and, and potentially leave other components behind. And as a result of that, we see inconsistency in what those cows consume relative to what we predict those cows consume. And as a result of that, we then end up with unpredictable outcomes. The cows may not necessarily produce to the target that we would like to see. And, and we have lots of evidence of that. We see um, at a herd level, we see less total production, less efficient production when we see herds where there's a lot of this dietary sorting or uh, selection of the ration going on. At a cow level, this becomes even more amplified. And just as an example of that, this is data from a study that we published a couple of years ago where we we're looking at individual cows and their feed selection and how that can then relate to their individual milk components. And in this case here, what you see is an association between milk fat uh, on the upper left side here and, and particle sorting, long particle sorting of the diet where this, these numbers here represent a, a percentage relative to predicted intake. So 100% would be they eat exactly what we put in front of them under 100% means they're selecting against that uh, component of the diet. And this is long particles. So the long particles that sit on the top screen of the shaker box here. And what you see here, if you look from right to left, is that as cow cows sort more against those long particles, we see lesser milk fat. In fact, over a full percentage point in milk fat is explained by this difference in particle sorting. Now, again, not a perfect relationship, but if you think about that a significant proportion of that variation is going to be explained by genetic differences. All these cows are eating the same diet on paper, producing a very similar amount of milk, eating a very similar quantity of total dry matter. This prediction of a, that much variability in milk fat just based on how much sorting those cows do is, is very significant. And then if you look on the bottom right here, it wasn't just milk fat, but also milk protein that we saw a very similar relationship with us with this. So suggesting that sorting does not only negatively have an effect on say fiber consumption, which would potentially influence milk fat, but also on the total balance of nutrients consumed, which is potentially affecting milk protein in this case as well. And so obviously then uh, balancing uh, or designing rations and management strategies to minimize the risk of this selection behavior becomes very important there as well. The other aspect of eating behavior that I think we, we really need to think about is that the post ingestive kind of eating behavior, which is the rumination behavior of the cow. And again, rumination is what makes cows unique as a ruminant. Um, and it's what they do actually most of their time. So they spend four or five hours of the day at the feed bunk. They actually spend twice as much time uh, ruminating uh, eight to 10 hours a day doing that. And most of that while they're lying down and, and that rumination behavior really keeps the rumen working and healthy. And first and foremost, uh, they chew while they're ruminating as you see this cow here doing, which is gonna help reduce the size of the feed particles that she's consumed, increase the surface area, which is gonna increase bacterial attachment to those feed particles, which then increases or potentially increases the rate of digestion of those feed particles. So. In fact, the more rumination the cow does, the potentially the quicker that cow can actually digest her feed, pass it from the rumen, which then results or leads to a quicker return to eating in those cows. And so the more the cow ruminates or the more efficient she does that, potentially the quicker she can eat and the more she can eat from that as well. 
And so there's potentially a link for it with feed intake in, in that perspective. We also know from a health perspective and specifically a rumen health standpoint that cows, while they're chewing, produce a ton of saliva and that saliva contains a lot of buffer, which is gonna help also buffer then the rumen environment and keep that rumen stable from that perspective as well. And so hugely important from, uh, or for that reason as well. So the combined uh, effect of those things then is that we know that more rumination is good. And, and specifically when we think of the relationship with intake, and, and this is data from the same study I presented before, we see kind of a similar thing where higher intake cows are gonna be also going to be needing to spend more time ruminating. In fact, those cows with the highest level of intake are gonna be spending uh, upwards of, like I said before, eight, nine, 10 hours per day or more ruminating. And so anything that's gonna potentially limit their ability to spend that time ruminating is gonna have a potential negative impact on their ability to say, maximize their dry matter intake. And so we need to think about that from a management standpoint as well. If there's anything that may limit the cow's ability to spend that time ruminating, that's gonna have a trickle down effect on, a, on her intake as well. One of the probably critical time periods where we need to think about this is, is that transition period. And, and a lot of our focus in the dairy industry is around this and, and for good reason, because this is where, again, uh, a lot of uh, positives and negatives can occur for dairy cows. But one of the things that we know specifically is that uh, those cows that say remain healthy over that transition period, as opposed to those cows that develop um, common uh, conditions like ketosis and other health disorders in and around that transition period, uh, those cows that stay healthy do tend to have more consistency in their rumination and eating behavior during that time period. And, and you can see that here, not only post-calving when obviously those health conditions arise, but even pre-calving those cows display more consistency in that behavior as opposed to those cows that do succumb to illness are, are demonstrating a drop in that rumination time. And, and again, largely this is gonna be related to the intake because we know that those cows that succumb to illness are more likely to have drops in, in feed consumption during that time period. But we also know that that rumination behavior is not only linked to the intake level of those cows, but also are gonna be related to other say potential stressors during that time period. So things like heat stress, things like comfort, stall stocking density, overall stocking density, all those kind of things which may impose or pose stressors on those animals, particularly at this time period, are gonna also then potentially have a additive effect on, uh, on this behavior or, and, and specifically a negative effect on the ability of those, these cows to engage in as much rumination as uh, they probably should in and around that time period, which then may predispose them to more issues later on. Thinking about this then too, from a practical standpoint and, and leading into uh, um, some of the thoughts around that is, is the fact that we need to think then about when cows actually ruminate. And, and again, rumination is, is going to occur primarily when cows are not eating, right? So uh, I think that's pretty clear. Uh, it's important to point out though that most of that rumination is going to occur in, in this case uh, specifically kind of middle of the day and particularly the late evening and early morning hours when we, in many cases, observe cows spending the bulk majority of their time lying down. In fact, most rumination occurs when cows are lying down. And, and again, in, in interest of time, we're not gonna get into too much detail on that in this presentation, but the comfort of the cow from a lying perspective then can have a huge impact on her ability to spend enough time ruminating. And so if we manage things such that cows cannot spend as much time lying down as they'd like to. Again, for example, if, if cows are overcrowded, if they're not comfortable, if they're say stressed, heat stressed, if stalls aren't designed well, if they're not big enough, if stall surfaces are not comfortable enough, all those kind of things, which we know have a negative impact on the lying behavior of the cows or the ability of cows to optimize the amount of time they spend lying down, that then is going to also potentially have a negative impact on the ability of that cow to optimize the amount of time she needs to ruminate as well, which as I described before, then can have negative impacts on her eating behavior as well and her, her total feed consumption levels. And so all very important things to uh, consider. That then kind of brings me into the next part of my presentation. So that's more the theory behind why eating behavior is important. Uh, 
the next question we have to ans answer is, what does this mean now from a nutritional management standpoint? And what are the things that we can do to take advantage of uh, that knowledge from a, from a management standpoint? I think first and foremost is, is the fact that we need to be providing diets, uh, rations for cows that are uh, formulated for good eating behavior. And so consumption of small frequent meals, difficult to sort, stimulate rumination, all things that I described to you before are, are positive for cows. And again, we could spend a whole webinar talking about this in the interest of today. I'm not gonna focus specifically on this aspect, except make one point in that the, the primary factor, uh, dietary factor associated with this uh, and, and promoting good uh, consumption behavior uh, would be proper forage management. And, and we have a lot of obviously emphasis on forage uh, uh, management as part of a diet because it does represent a, a significant proportion of, of most dairy diets. Uh, but from an eating standpoint, the, the primary factors that are going to contribute to uh, good behavior are the quality of the forage um, and specifically how digestible it is. And I mentioned before, and I'll come back to this in a few moments, the, the better the digestibility is, the better quality the forage is, the uh, quicker that gets digested, the quicker it passes through the rumen, the quicker that cow can then return to eating. And so that promotes that, that better and, and, and faster kind of return to eating more meals and, and potentially more consumption at the end of the day. Quantity of forage can, can have a, an impact there. Uh, and this, there's always a balance there. So whereby uh, we don't want too little forage because that then uh, is going to promote uh, unhealthy eating patterns, unhealthy rumen environments, also even makes that ration more difficult to sort. But at the same time, uh, we need to ensure there's sufficient energy in that diet that obviously we're, we're optimizing production in those cows. Type of forage can, can play an important role there if we have, or we're in an area where we're feeding more dry forages, that represents more difficulty from an eating behavior standpoint, particularly, and, and the last point here, particle size plays a big role there. If the particle size of those forages are long, that can, create even more difficulty from an eating behavior standpoint. And so those are all things that are critical to manage. And again, uh, I'm going to leave it at that for today. Um, and I'd be happy to have discussions on these points with you uh, either after or at another time point, if you, if you would like. Let's say we get the diet right then. The next question is, or the next thing that we need to think about is, we get that diet correct and we get that in front of the cows. We need to then make sure that cows are stimulated to get to their feed and access their feed throughout the day. And, and to really ensure that good eating pattern where we're seeing frequent meals, we're seeing good bunk attendance, all those things I described earlier that are important for a intake and, and room and health and efficiency standpoint. Question that comes with this then is, when does a cow actually go and eat at the feed bunk? And, and, and so if we're gonna stimulate that cow to go there, we need to be able to answer this question of, of when does the cow go? And the most simple answer that I can give and, and you can give is when she's hungry. Now, the, the next question is, well, when is a cow hungry? And again, not necessarily a completely simple answer to uh, give you, but there's probably two main things that would uh, identify uh, hunger in an animal. And one would be how quickly that cow say, empties her rumen out of the feed that she has consumed. And again, this schematic here uh, is again, fairly simplified, but suggests that the, the more the cow is going to consume, the more feed she's gonna be able to put into that rumen, it's gonna depend on how quickly she can pass the feed that she has consumed from her rumen. And so that's gonna be related to the digestion rate. So the digestibility, how quickly stuff gets digested in the rumen. And then that then also ties into how fast that digesta passes from the rumen itself. The quicker those things can happen, the quicker it's emptied. We have a physical fullness uh, um, uh, component to hunger there, whereby uh, as that rumen empties, then that cow then becomes more likely to go resume eating again to, to fill herself up. And so that's one component of it. The other component of hunger is a metabolic aspect whereby the quicker she can clear the metabolites, so the things that she's absorbed from her feed and from the digestion of her feed, like volatile fatty acids and particularly something like propionate, the quicker she can clear that from her bloodstream and, and 
uh, her, her liver, for example, we also know that that may be a trigger for that animal to then quicker return to eating as well. And so those are primarily the most important things from a stimulation of, of uh, consumption standpoint. And so largely that's gonna come back to the quality of the feed and the digestibility of the feed that that cow consumes playing a big role there. The other thing that we need to think about is that there are certain times of the day when cows will consume more feed. And traditionally, we've thought that there are even particularly hours of the day where we see more feeding activity, like the morning and evening. And we definitely do see that in, say, cows that are kept outside. And they feed in a very diurnal kind of pattern, where largest and longest eating bouts are typically in the morning and afternoon. For cows that are fed conserved diets, total mixed rations, particularly those that are kept in, in confinement housing, in, in barns and in freestyle barns and dry lots and things like that, largely that eating pattern actually is dictated by management events like feed delivery, like milking and, and even the, the push up of that feed in the bunk. Of all of those things, we know that it is actually the delivery of the feed that has the greatest single stimulatory effect on those cows. And that's something we've demonstrated actually in a large number of projects that uh, when we look at it for confinement cows kept uh, or fed TMR, the single biggest driver to them to the feed bunk is the delivery of new feed. And particularly the first delivery of feed of the day after that bunk has been cleaned out uh, seems to be the time period when we see that largest response of those cows. And so from that, uh, it's not surprising then that the timing and frequency of delivery of feed can have a big impact on the eating patterns of cows in, in those scenarios. And again, the data would support that, whereby and this is one example from one study of ours, and there's lots of others to suggest that, that as we deliver feed more often, and when I say more often, I say more than say one delivery per day, we go to twice a day or more often, what we see, particularly from an eating behavior standpoint, is those cows spending more time at the bunk, spreading out their consumption more evenly, having more meals per day, not necessarily always consuming more, but having that better eating pattern, whereby we see much more consistency in what those cows consume across the day. That then um, also is, is ties with, or it comes with also more consistency in what the cows consume. Because the other thing that we've observed in, in the case of this study and, and others where we've done field studies looking at feed selection or feed sorting is that we see much more consistency in what cows consume when they're fed more often. And, and that makes sense. If cows have one pile of feed per day to sort through versus multiple smaller piles, it's gonna be more difficult for them to sort those multiple smaller piles. And so as a result of that, we see much more consistency in uh, the consumption of those cows. And then from a production standpoint, actually most of the benefit that we see is not necessarily eating more, but actually things related to that consistency in, in eating behavior and then the consistency that has on the rumen. And so things like better efficiency of production, better milk components, particularly milk fat, are common uh, biological responses that we see when we say feed cows more often. A uh, really good kind of neat example of that is this data that comes out of the Northeast US uh, from a few years ago, where they were looking at herds and classifying herds based on de novo fatty acid content of the milk. And if you followed this at all, you know that de novo fatty acids are those fatty acids, are a component of the fatty acids we find in milk that are primarily formed within the uh, udder of the cow. And so these are short chain fatty acids that are um, uh, formed from the short chain fatty acids that actually make their way from the bloodstream into the udder of the cow. And uh, what we know is that that formation of those um, uh, de novo fatty acids in the other of the cow is going to be related to uh, things like uh, rumen health, uh, whereby if, say, cows have acidosis situations, low rumen pH situations, the uh, biohydrogenated intermediates actually um, uh, go to the udder and will block the formation of those de novo fatty acids. And so uh, in those situations, we see less de novo fatty acid production. And as you can see here in this graph, that de novo fatty acid content is highly related to milk fat content overall. And so if we have low de novo, we tend to have 
lower milk fat overall. Long story short, uh, what they found in the case of the study was that those herds that have higher de novo fatty acid content were more likely to be feeding their cows more often. So five times more likely to feed twice a day versus those herds feeding once a day. So really tying that link between the delivery of feed, the more consistent consumption and indicators in this case of, of improved rumen health. Now, one of the points that I wanted to make and, and highlight is the fact that uh, on a lot of farms, delivering feed multiple times per day might not always be practical. And so we can also then think about what are other ways of stimulating that intake behavior more consistently throughout the day. And one of the things to consider, and, and I mentioned this before, is that there's lots of different things that actually stimulate uh, bunk attendance and, and feed intake in cows. And uh, one of the things that we know is that cows will eat, say, after milking, as well as feed delivery. And so those two events don't necessarily need to be tied together. And traditionally, in a lot of farms, they are. But uh, as long as, say, cows have feed available to them and sufficient feed available to them, they will eat after milking. And so it doesn't necessarily need to be fresh feed at that time. And what we demonstrated in uh, the study where I have data on the screen here is that if we push feed delivery to between milking, so in the case of the study, we milk three times a day and fed them twice a day. If we push the feed deliveries away from milking time, uh, in the case here of the later afternoon and again the next morning here, what we actually see is a change in intake behavior whereby those cows have more meals per day, they eat slower. So all these things I described as is good from a, a health and efficiency standpoint earlier. And that's what we observed is we actually observed an improvement in feed efficiency in these cows. And so that would suggest to us that by staggering these management events, we can actually uh, elicit a better feeding behavior response in these cows. The other aspect uh, of bunk attendance and, and feeding behavior that I think we need to consider is also just making sure that the feed is present for those cows in the bunk. And again, it sounds simple, but it's, it's something that we still struggle with in, in a lot of farms. And um, the challenge is that the, and it goes back to what I was describing before, the stimulus for cows to eat should be an internal stimulus. It should be derived by the hunger of the cows in relation to the quality of the feed that we're providing to them. And so better, obviously better quality feed, better quality forages, that's gonna stimulate more hunger, quicker return to eating, all those kind of things. That should then stimulate that cow to the bunk. And when the cow goes to the bunk, the feed should be there. And that's why we push up feed in the bunk. Too many situations I see that we push up feed and we see the cows respond. And in those situations, that tells me that we're too late because that tells me if we're pushing up feed and the cows respond, we see the cows come running, that means we're too late. That means those cows are already hungry and they're not eating because the feed's not available to them. And so we need to make sure that that feed gets pushed up as often as needed so that those cows actually don't respond. And it's that natural drive to intake to feed that's actually getting them up and getting them to the bunk. And if we don't do that, then we're going to see cows using their time ineffectively. And, and we have evidence of that, actually. And uh, we published this study a, a few years ago where by we were looking at the association of production and behavior and management in, in robot herds or AMS herds. And what we observed in the case of the study was that there was an association between how often feed was being pushed up on these herds and the lying time of those cows, whereby we saw that for every two extra feed pushups per day, we saw 0.1 hours of extra lying duration. Now that doesn't sound like very much, but across the range of feed pushups across herds, that was the equivalent of about an hour extra lying time based on extra feed pushups across that range. And so that's a huge amount of lying time that we can gain in those cows, which obviously keeps them off their feet, gets them in the stalls, gets them ruminating, all good things that we know, as well as probably in this case, allowing them to use their time more efficiently at the feed bunk. And so better from an overall time budget standpoint. We also know that that feed pushup then can be uh, important for making sure the cows are not limited in their consumption. And I like to use this example here, another robot study, this one from the US Midwest, where they had a fairly small sample of herds, 33 herds, but in this case, they demonstrated this huge difference, 4.9 kilos, almost 11 pounds milk difference between herds using 
uh, manual feed push-up versus those with automated feed push-up. And again, you might look at this and think, wow, that's amazing. A automated feed push-up must be the way to go. And again, while it does have its benefits, I would argue that it's not the automated feed push-up that's actually driving this result. It's actually the fact that those that were doing it manually or those farms that were doing it manually are just not doing a good enough job. Uh, what the automatic feed push-up does is, is does it consistently and does it throughout a 24 hour period to make sure that that feeds continuously available. And many of our farms were, were say pushing up feed manually, either we're just not doing it consistently enough, we don't have enough labor to make sure that it's being done on a, on a hourly or every two hour basis throughout a 24 hour period. And that's where we run that risk of empty bunks and, and cows with longer periods of time where they might be hungry or without feed. And, and that's what's really driving this result. And so at the end of the day, for me, it doesn't matter how it gets done, as long as it's getting done and it's getting done consistently. And we have some more recent data, which would suggest that, uh, again, it's probably not necessarily the type, but the fact that it getting, it's getting done that consistently, that's having that, that big impact. And this is a larger study that we just completed here in Canada in 2019 with almost 200 farms where the mean delivery or, or sorry push-up frequency was over 12 times per day so on average more than every two hours per day feed was getting pushed up on these farms the majority of these farms were using some kind of automated system but regardless of the type of system what we found was that for every five extra feed push-ups that there was 0.35 kilos or just under or, or sorry just over uh, three quarters of a pound of extra milk. And so again, suggesting here that probably more to do with the fact that that feed's actually getting to the cows than how we're actually doing it. So it doesn't matter how we do it, it just matters that we do it and we do that consistently. Okay, that gets me to the final point that, that I want to uh, talk about here uh, today. And that's that we need to also manage housing so that cows can access their feed. So it's not only making sure that the feed is there, but that the way we manage and design the housing that cows are in that gives them that opportunity to get to their feed uh, as well. And the biggest thing there, or the biggest complication from an eating behavior standpoint is the role that competition at the feed bunk has on the behavior of cows. And I always like to use this video because it kind of neatly describes what happens when cows run into competitive situations at the feed bunk. And I'll play this video and what you'll see is this cow number eight here, I described as the actor, she's gonna displace number two here as the reactor. And again, if you watch cows eating, this is something you see quite often. You see cows eating at the bunk and you'll see them jostle for position. And you see like in this case of this video here, this cow get displaced from the feed bunk. Now, what I want you to think about is what are the options for this cow? So this cow has really three options. She can stand around and wait, which again is not a good use of her time. We want cows to be productive in their time budgets. We want them lying down, we want them eating, we want them milking or drinking. Standing around is not productive time use. It's gonna be hard on her feet. It's gonna be a take away from time that she might have for those other activities. So it's something that we wanna avoid. Her other option is to go lie down. Again, lying down is not bad, but maybe she just got out of the parlor. We want that cow to stand on her feet for let's say at least half an hour, if not 45 minutes before she lies down to allow her teeth ends to close. And so probably not the best time for her to go lie down. We actually want her to be eating at this time. And that's likely what she's gonna to wanna to do. So her third option is to push her way back in and try to find a spot at the feed bunk as well. And the end result of that then is a change in her intake behavior whereby we'll see more displacements, We'll see all the cows increase their rate of consumption. They'll have bigger meals. They'll eat faster. All those things I described earlier, which are not good from an eating behavior standpoint. And so that's where uh, we run into a challenge there with situations where we have feed bunk competition. We have overcrowding. We don't have enough space and we end up with a negative impact on the eating behavior of those cows. From a study standpoint, what we've demonstrated is that in a lot of situations, cows are kind of resilient from an intake. So uh, especially kind of mid lactation, later lactation cows, pretty resilient, even to some level of overstocking whereby they'll be able to manage some level of, or some consistency in the level of feed intake that they consume. And even milk production can remain pretty steady under 
overcrowded situations. Uh, not all the time, but, but definitely can be. The bigger risk there is the change in intake pattern and some of the resulting uh, associated effects of that. And that's definitely something that we have seen both in experimental situations as well as field situations as well. And I highlight this result. This is a study we did um, uh, again uh, a fair number of years ago already, almost 10 years ago, a field study of Canadian herds where we surveyed how much space they had at the feed bunk and other management factors, dietary factors, et cetera, and correlated that with some productive outcomes on those farms. And what we found in the case of this analysis was that uh, the mean amount of space was close to our recommendation, which I'll come to in a minute, it's close to that two foot or uh, 60 centimeters of, of space per cow, but that did range considerably from just uh, over a foot to almost three feet of space per cow or 36 to 99 centimeters per cow. What we found was that every four inch or 10 centimeter increase across this range was associated with better milk fat and lower somatic cell count. And again, the explanation there, if you think about the impacts on the behavior of the cows and the behavioral patterns of those cows, eating behavior, lying patterns, when they lie down, all those kind of things, these associations with milk components, in these case, fat and, and somatic cell count make sense as we probably with more space lessen the risk of things like acidosis, subacute renal acidosis, um, butter fat depression associated with that. We reduce the stress on the cows, which obviously can have an impact on somatic cell count, but also just improve when those cows lie down, say in relationship to milking as well, which uh, may be having a, an impact on other health as well. This was also, or similar results were demonstrated in, in that other study I described from the Northeast US where they're looking at uh, fatty acid content and, and classifying cows as high and low de novo. Again, in the case of this study, what they found, which was interesting, was that those herds with high de novo, so again, high, fatter high fat test, were 10 times more likely to have at least 18 inches of bunk space or 46 centimeters of bunk space per cow. And, and why that number is of interest is, 18 inches is pretty well the amount of bunk space that you would have in a, say a three row barn at 100% stocking density. And so if you're less than that, it's likely that you're in a three row barn and you've got some level of overcrowding, which again, if we look in the industry, there's a fair number of uh, facilities out there that are like that. And so that then becomes a risk factor, not only for other things, but in, in this case, particularly for say low milk fat and can be a contributing factor there as well again, uh, caused or, or, or conveyed through those changes in eating patterns of cows when they're forced to uh, be overcrowded. So the, the question then becomes is how do we mitigate competition at the feed bunk? And again, not a necessarily a simple uh, answer or, or thing to uh, deal with, but we can think about obviously some of the contributing factors there. So uh, number one being managing stocking density to optimize bunk space. And again, it's good to have targets here. Uh, I think the data would suggest that, um, that our target or our ideal of at least uh, 60 centimeters or 24 inches of bunk space per cow for lactating cows uh, should still be the, the, the standard uh, within the industry. Uh, research would suggest that uh, if as we move down from that, if we, in situations where we're overcrowded or three row barns where we have less space than that, we end up with that change in eating pattern and potential negative effects on those cows from a uh, production and efficiency standpoint. And so again, that, that should be our target. The data would also suggest that uh, for our transition cows, for those cows that are most vulnerable, close up cows and fresh cows, not only do we see a change in their intake pattern, but for those cows, we actually see uh, and, and consistent, more consistently see reductions in dry matter intake as we overcrowd them at the feed bunk. And particularly during that close-up period, that's where we're most concerned because as I mentioned even earlier, when we see declines in intake during that time period, those declines in intake are nearly always correlated with not only lesser intake post-calving, but greater risk of post-calving problems uh, related to things like negative energy balance and even that trickle effect into even reproductive problems in those cows. And so our target there is to optimize the amount of space we get to those cows during that time period, at least say 75 centimeters, 30 inches of space per cow to minimize that risk of 
um, uh, a, a limitation on the intake of those cows. Besides the stocking density of the cows, the other thing that we can think about is uh, lessening competition at the feed bunk through the design of the barn and, and, and specifically uh, use of a feed barrier which may lessen competition. And uh, as example, uh, comparison of say using headlocks versus a post and rail or, or uh, more open bunk type system. And again, um, we did studies, a couple studies I cited on the screen here uh, over 15 years ago to suggest that in situations where we provide cows headlocks versus open bunks, we see less competition. And so they can be protective from a competition standpoint. Now, I make the point though that that doesn't still make up for uh, overcrowding and less uh, physical or, or linear space per cow. And so uh, even in a, 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 a bunk where we have headlocks, if we don't have enough space per cow, we're gonna see increased levels of competition. And that's one of the challenges too, is that with headlocks that are traditionally spaced say at 24 inches um, and cows being wider than that, we end up with some inefficiency in, in space usage at the bunk as well. And for that reason, we've seen within the industry a movement towards say wider headlocks, uh, ones that are say anywhere uh, in and around the 27, 28 inch wide uh, range to actually accommodate, better accommodate the space of the cow and actually allow for actually better bunk occupancy than uh, those, those traditional more smaller uh, headlocks as well. Uh, another option that uh, we studied again a number of years ago, 15 years ago already, we published a paper looking at these feed stalls that could be used at the feed bunk as well. Again, uh, something that's uh, been floated in the industry. We don't see a lot of adoption, but there are some of them out there. Uh, again, the, the data that we have would suggest that they do a very good job in terms of, again, limiting competition between cows. Uh, and that limiting competition comes over and above the extra space that they come with. Because again, these would have to be spaced at wide enough to allow cows to uh, get into. And so we're not only giving the cows more space, but we're giving them that physical barrier that's gonna help limit or prevent competition between cows. Now, again, in most facilities, uh, that would be very difficult to uh, implement because that's going to effectively limit how many spaces there are at the bunk. And so again, probably a starting point with systems like this are going to be our, um, our close-up pens, fresh cow pens, where we may be allocating that uh, closer amount of already 30 inches of, of bunk space per cow, or ideally we're giving that amount of space and we're going to further reduce competition with that as well. The other uh, thing that comes into mind when, when we're trying to mitigate competition of the feed bunk is actually going back to the idea of making sure feed is available. And it goes back to my previous point that regardless of what's going on, the, the fact that if we don't have good management of the feed, that's also going to have a negative impact on their eating behavior. And that's going to be compounded in situations where, say, we have competition for feed access. And there's a really neat study done out of the Miner Institute led by uh, Dr. Rick Grant from a number of years ago that uh, whereby they actually mimicked kind of an empty bunk situation overnight where they limited feed access from 1 a.m. to 6 a.m. and they overcrowded those cows in, in that scenario. And what they observed was that when those two factors were combined, they saw even a greater kind of pronouncement. So up to nine hours more subacute rumen acidosis, so low rumen pH, less fiber digestion, so a reduction in NDF digestion rate of up to 50% based on the kind of combined effect of both the overcrowding and limited feed access, which putting what I've spoken to uh, together here uh, today would have a very negative impact on the eating behavior of those cows, whereby you'd see more slug feeding, more large meals, eating faster, all those kind of negative things. And so we obviously making sure cows always have feed available to them, and, and that feed is um, pushed up and all those things is gonna help prevent those negative effects from occurring. In the last couple of minutes, I just wanted to highlight one more thing uh, and specifically relationship to uh, uh, feed bunk uh, space and, 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 and feed bunk competition. And that's uh, the question of whether or not we can get away with less space in certain scenarios and, and specifically in, in robot barns. And um, there's been some suggestion in the industry we've seen a lot of adoption of robotic milking uh, throughout the industry, and it continues to grow. 
one of the questions that people have is whether or not we can get away with less space, and particularly the feed bunk, with the idea that because cows are on, say, more personal schedules, there's less kind of a group effect going on, we may have less kind of group feeding at the bunk, whether or not that then translates into ability to, say, design facilities where we have less space, and, and obviously we can use space more efficiently. The, the challenge with that thought is that we don't really have data to support that. In fact, we actually, in some field studies, have kind of the opposite. And uh, I um, uh, point you to one field study we did, again, a fairly small sample size uh, from 2011, so almost 10 years ago, looking at robot farms in Ontario, Canada, where the mean amount of space was very good, so almost 28 inches, so lots of feed bunk space for these cows. And that ranged from 12 to 39. So again, on the low end to high end. And interestingly, in that study, what we observed was an association between space and production and behavior of cows, whereby for every four inches of extra space or 10 centimeters, we saw 1.7 kilos more milk. Uh, so almost four pounds more milk and 0.4 hours extra lying duration. And so uh, again, pointing towards what I described before, probably a more efficient use of the time of those cows because they had better bunk access and uh, that translating into more milk uh, in those cows as well. More recently in this larger study we did in 200 farms or close to 200 farms uh, across Canada uh, of robot farms uh, in 2019, we saw less average bunk space, but more similar to what we consider kind of the industry standard. So 64 centimeters or 25 inches on average, but a lot of variation around that still. And what's interesting is that across that range, again, for every 10 centimeters extra or four inches of extra bunk space, we saw an increase in milk yield. Now, in this case, a lot less, so only 0.3 kilograms per four, four inches of extra bunk space, likely because the feeding management is that much better over that time period, whereby we've seen a lot more adoption of automated feeding systems, a lot more adoption of automated feed push-up and just better feeding management at the bunk. So probably less of a response there, but still there's something to be said for the fact that we're seeing more production with more space on these farms. And so going back to my question, can we get away with less space at the feed bunk in these robotic barns? My answer is, I guess we don't have any evidence to suggest we can. Um, there may be situations where it may be okay, and I, I put a big maybe there and, and say that it has to come with great management, in particular feeding management. And, and so those situations might be, say, milk first guided traffic barns where, say, cows have to pass through a selection gate before going to the bunk, which might limit that kind of slug effect on the bunk. Um, farms where they're only providing like a forage PMR in the bunk, which again is not hugely popular within the industry, but it is happening or uh, situations where we have excellent feeding management where we're seeing high delivery of uh, frequency of feed delivery, let's say six to eight times a day using an automated system, we might be able to in that situation, again, get away with less space. But uh, I would caution you and say that we don't have the data to support that. Those are kind of speculative things at this time point. So with that, that gets me to the end of my presentation. Uh, quick quick uh, take home messages. How cows eat is just as important as the nutritional composition of the feed we provide. And, and that's gonna then promote cow health efficiency and productivity. And so just because we put a good diet in front of cows doesn't necessarily mean they're going to produce optimally from that. We need to then that cow to eat that diet in a manner that's good for them. And again, that's gonna come from the diet itself and, and the formulation of that, but as much so if not more from the management of that feed and the environment of the cow in which she consumes that feed is gonna have a big impact on that eating behavior. So with that, I thank you very much and hope we have uh, some time for some questions uh, right now. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you very much. Uh, I think we all really enjoyed that. We've got a number of questions, which we won't all have time for, but what we'll do is we'll send an email off to Trevor and ask it, that he can answer them when he is able. And we'll go from there. So the first question is, how does the feed intake pattern change in robot barns and free flow versus forced flow? So I think you covered some of this. Yeah, so that was kind of the point I was getting at the end there. And, and um, the, I guess my short answer is, 
there, there is potentially some differences there. We don't actually have a lot of really good data making that comparison in robot barns and, and, and specifically between free traffic and guided traffic uh, scenarios. Some older data would suggest that in guided traffic systems, uh, there's a little bit more of a hesitancy for cows to say pass through selection gates. And as a result of that, we may end up with situations where cows have lesser meals per day, larger, and then therefore larger kind of meals of PMR, not necessarily eating less, and, but there has been some studies where they've seen that. Um, uh, and, and therefore maybe a, a pattern that's more greater risk of acidosis. And so um, again, I think some of that can be overcome by great management of the feed bunk and the, the, the PMR at the bunk. Uh, but there is always probably a little bit of a higher risk in a guided traffic system for those kind of more negative eating behavior patterns than in a free traffic scenario. Perfect. And this question comes from Facebook. If cows eat more at their first meal of the day, is it favor favorable to change the forage to grain ratio at the first feeding? Yeah, so that's an interesting one is whether or not we, we can feed cows um, uh, based on kind of diurnal pattern within the day. Um, and uh, again, I know there, there is some people that are working on this. I, I don't know if we have really conclusive kind of evidence to suggest that's something we should be doing. Um, uh, I guess from a practical standpoint, uh, it's, just, it's just very difficult. And, and I think that would probably be the biggest limiting a uh, factor from implementing something like that is that it just gets too confusing if we're mixing different diets for the same group of cows, et cetera, within a day. Um, I, would, I would err on the side of that. It actually makes more sense to uh, make sure that the management of that feed then doesn't necessarily cause that large uh, meal or as large of a meal. And so if we're seeing a huge slug feeding response, make sure that we're doing everything else. So we're, we're managing the stocking density. We're making sure that those cows aren't without feed for too long before that delivery, because I, I didn't really get into that in too much detail. Uh, I mentioned that that largest meal does happen after bunk clean out. And one of the things that we know is that the longer that bunk is empty prior to that uh, initial feed delivery, the bigger meal or the bigger response we'll see there as well. And so that can be problematic as well. So I'd almost rather see improvement in the management of the feed at the bunk rather than changing the composition itself. All right. Well, I think I'm going to end us there. We do have a number of other questions, but like I said, we'll get Trevor to answer in his available time. And I'd like to say thank you to everybody for joining us. We have a number of upcoming webinars that hopefully you've signed up for our email and we can give to you there. Here's a snapshot of them and we'll go from there. And thank you again, Trevor. We really appreciate you coming out. No, no problem. And, and yeah, I'd be happy to answer email uh, questions by email, either uh, through yourself or, or directly from the participants here today. So thank you. All right, have a great day, everyone.